Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, it's after a week's break. Welcome to our regulars and welcome to our first timers this week. My name is Alan Friedman. I'm Vice President of the Australian Jewish Association, and I am again your MC for this evening. Um, on your screens, you'll be able to see David Adler, President of the AJA, and as well as that, our special guest for tonight, for tonight, Malka Fleischer, who we will introduce formally in a moment. Tonight's topic is Israel advocacy, but uh, a little bit different because we're going to have a look at it from a, a woman's perspective. David and I will chat with Malka for about 30 minutes, and then we'll open up to questions from the audience. Uh, for those that uh, are not familiar with the process, we ask you to electronically raise your hand if you want to ask a question. And the way to do that is go onto the participants icon uh, on the bottom of your screen. And if you click on that, you'll find a, a little thing that says raise hand. Uh, so click on that and then we see that you're there and we just put you in the, in the queue and uh, we take people in order. The chat function is also uh, operating and as usual, we just ask people to stick to, to tonight's topic and try not to wander off on all sorts of issues. Now, Malka Fleischer is a mother of three and lives in Judea with her famous husband, Yishai Fleischer, uh, our friend and official representative of the Jewish community of Hebron. Uh, but she is an advocate for Israel in her own right. Malka is a social media and content strategy professional at Jerusalem U, managing a Facebook page of almost 350,000 followers. She earned a law degree from the Cardozo School of Law in New York and a BA in political communication from George Washington University in Washington, DC. Tonight, Malka will give us her perspective on Israel advocacy as a woman and mother living in a hotspot hot spot such as Hebron in Judea. Malka, welcome to the HIA, welcome to Australia and our Zoom sessions. Wow, this is my first trip to Australia. I'm so excited. <laughs> well, we'll have to, we'll have <laughs> to get to you. Yeah, I hope to be there one day in person. Um, uh, Ishai, who you mentioned, it's like one of his favorite places in the world and the uh, Jewish community in Australia is so warm and so incredible. And I really want to thank you, uh, Alan and Dr. David, for having me today. And, uh, you know, just looking into, I, I went to the uh, um, Australia Jewish Association website just to look and just the values of this organization and of the people who are associated with it um, are really strengthening and inspiring. And, um, and uh, it's, it's so heartwarming in the crazy world that we live in today to see mm -hmm. that we that these connections um, are maintained solidly between Jews around the world, um, between Jews in the land of Israel and Jews outside the land of Israel. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yes, we, we really are one big family, aren't we? Um, so just to set the scene for tonight's um, discussion, Malka recently achieved worldwide attention when she debated prominent left-wing uh, Jewish pro-Palestinian and BDS extremist Ariel Gold, who is the director of an organization called Code Pink, and who was denied entry into Israel in 2018, but welcomed uh, in Iran. Now, before David starts uh, chatting with Malka, take a look at this short video clip, which is which we saw as sort of a, a women's heavyweight Zionist versus anti-Zionist fight. Um, David, if you want to share, do screen sharing, and, and let's have a look at the video. Uh, yes, I will. It's, a, it's just a two-minute clip. It's been edited in a rather spectacular way uh, with some special effects uh, to emphasise... Uh, well, you'll see it. Here we go. Are you suggesting that the Palestinians don't want their own state? Are you saying that they don't want their own state? And if you are saying that, the two states who did you ask? Who made you the Israel. spokesperson for local peoples? You, you don't live here. You don't know the people here. You oh, don't uh, know what's going on here. You come in from your occupied house in Ithaca. Oh! And you like white splain with your colonialist Western concepts of what governments and peoples are supposed to look like. Oh! And you think that everyone around here is like, it's like, it's almost like you're a Christian missionary. It's like you come in, we're the heathens, 
okay? And you come in with your big holy Bible and you're like, come peoples, I will make you human beings. Let me teach you how to run countries. Let me tell you what governance should look like. Let me tell you who should live where. And I say to you, Actually, back up. You don't know what's going on here. You are not a representative of the Palestinians. <laughs> you are you don't listen when people talk. The Palestinian Authority is is constantly saying uh, that they want a two state solution, that they want a two state solution. They pay millions of dollars uh, every year to the families of terrorists. Um, there was a survey that happened in 2014, after Mahmoud Abbas passed that legislation making people who sell land to Jews um, punishable by life imprisonment, 65% of people who call themselves Palestinians in that survey by the Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey Research in 2018, 64.4% said they support the death sentence for selling land to Jews. 87.8% said that Palestinians who sell land to Jews should be traitors should be called traitors. Now, what you're telling me is that those people want to be part of the state of Israel. Is that what you're telling me? Uh, yeah. Well, there we go. <laughs> I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you're on our side, uh, Malka. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, Ariel, uh, she's a special, she's special. And um, her message is really one, it, it doesn't take long, you know, she, she, she tries to sort of pass herself off as a human rights advocate, mm -hmm. but it doesn't take very long to scratch through the surface and understand that her goals are really just to weaken Israel, if not destroy Israel. So she, uh, she makes it not so hard, right. basically. Yeah. Okay, well, that, that introduces um, superbly the, the subject of our sort of uh, leftist, anti-Zionist Jews and anti-Zionist Jewish groups. It, it seems to me that they have primarily two targets. One is uh, the IDF, and the other is people like you who, who live in uh, uh, Judea, Samaria. H how significant are they? on the ground, do you see much of them? Um, they used to be more significant. The truth is that under the Trump administration, they were actually uh, weakened somewhat here in Israel, or rather the Israeli government felt that it had the backing necessary to kind of go after um, left organizations. And there are multiple le left-wing organizations that were there was an organization called TIF, which used to hang out a lot in Hebron. Incidentally, I just want to clarify, I don't live in Hebron. While we're very connected to Hebron and my husband works in Hebron, we don't live in Hebron, although we do live in Judea. Um, yeah, so TIF used to hang out a lot in Hebron um, and they were booted out, basically. And it was like for years and years and years, they would kind of lurk in the corners and try to um, find ways to get Jews um, in Hebron in trouble and to make, make kind of conflict between Arabs and Jews, and they were booted out. There's also an organization called Breaking the Silence, yeah. Yeah, um, which, is, which is, uh, has been significantly weakened um, in schools, and there are other organizations similar to that that used to be invited a lot more to Israeli schools to give their perspective on what's going on in Israel, and their position has been weakened also significantly. Um, but I would say that really, you know, there is a cultural battle, um, or I don't know if you, I mean, it is a cultural battle, but also a political battle that's being waged here in Israel, and you mm. can kind of see it happening in the fact that we keep having election after election and nobody is kind of willing to budge. And that's because a lot of those politicians really represent some like major ideas. We have the idea of, do we want Israel to be um, a totally secular state like all other Western states? Or do we want it to be a state that's a religious state? Or do we want it to maybe be like a mixture between those two things? Do we want Israel to be um, a country which is like very strong on its rights and strong in Judea and Samaria? Or do we want it to be a country which is way more acceptable in the international community and kind of 
uh, enmeshing itself and, and participating in the values that the international community has been over the last decades and decades telling us that we should be um, adhering to. Um, so the left-wing organizations in Israel, they're really just a part and parcel of that much bigger argument. Um, and, but I would say that really the, the place that I see them operating in their, all their glory, I guess, is outside of Israel. Yeah. In Israel, um, demographically even, we are just trending right. Uh, in Israel, a lot of young people are, you know, conservative in Israel doesn't mean what it means outside of Israel. A lot of times uh, in, outside of Israel, conservative or, or right-wing, I guess you would say, right-wing outside of Israel is a lot of like fiscal ideas. Um, and in Israel, the idea of being right is much more a nationalistic concept and much more um, about land, about security, about um, Jewish identity um, and where we wanna take that. Do we wanna take that hardcore? Do we wanna take that soft core? Do we wanna make it part of government? Do we not wanna make it part of government? Um, but outside the land of Israel, there's a lot of what's called intersectionality going on, which is that they, the left wing takes the issue of Israel and it like affixes it to other issues like being liberal fiscally, like being liberal culturally. Um, and so it's really become part of like a major identity crisis, I think, amongst uh, maybe crisis is an extreme word. Maybe it's not. I don't know. You can judge for yourself. Um, a but I'll call it a crisis, an identity crisis, which is happening for Jews outside the land of Israel, where they're trying to determine where they fit, where they fit in their home country, where their values mm -hmm. are in Israel. Um, I know that at the Australian Jewish Association, the good of Israel, what's good for the state of Israel is a big concern. Um, and that's something that, that could affect the voting of, of people within your organization. That certainly affects the activism of people in your organization. Um, and no, I, was, I wasn't going to ask you about things in Australia, but seeing you sort of touched on that. Okay. Um, the, the, and, and, you, and you're right, there is, there is a division of views uh, and it's part of the raison d'etre of HAA to, to be... Uh, pro-Israel to support um, Eretz Israel uh, as defined in the Torah. Uh, and uh, But, uh, you know, there, there are people who are taking the opposite view. At a political level, um, it's become sharper recently. Mm -hmm. We've had the Australian Labor Party at its recent mm -hmm. national conference uh, resolve support for a state of Palestine that it should recognize a, a state of Palestine in the event that Labor formed the government here. Um, what's your view on that? And uh, how significant is it when a, a, you know, a major party in Australia makes that sort of decision? Um, you know, I'm not such an expert on Australian politics, sure. but I'll tell you that um, it, it is significant. Uh, it is significant when countries want to recognize the state of Palestine, because what that means is that they are willing to, at the very minimum, at the very, like, very, very minimum, what they're willing to do is force Israel to give up a massive swath of land to reroute its population and to endanger itself strategically. And that's on the minimum, because you cannot you can't possibly see a state of Palestine as doing anything less than that. And that's assuming that it would go well after that, meaning to say that it would go relatively well, that there wouldn't be a major war, that there wouldn't be a regional breakout, um, that it wouldn't turn into another Hamas state. Um, you know, we have experience kind of with the creation of Palestinian states already. The expulsion or the disengagement uh, of Jews from um, Gush Katif in 20, uh, 2005 was a little bit of a test to see what it would look like if we would do the big plan of taking Jews out of Judea and Samaria. There is about 800,000 Jews living in 
uh, Judea, Samaria, and Eastern Jerusalem today. So that's a lot of people. But we tested it on about 8,500 people in Gush Katif, and we did a unilateral uh, yeah. disengagement, is what they called it. Um, and it was a source <laughs> of major internal struggle here in Israel, a massive, massive conflict. Um, like people from littlest age to oldest age were involved in a very heated discussion and and that summer, there were, you know, kids, teenagers all over the streets handing out uh, flags of Israel, don't expel the Jews from, from Gush Katif. But Ariel Sharon, the head of the Likud party, um, and one of Israel's most celebrated generals, basically forced through the policy to expel Jews from Gush Katif, saying that if we do this unilateral act, with, which the international community had been pushing us to do in a macro level for a long time in Judea and Samaria, if we do this, then it will be, you know, we'll finally um, do justice for Palestinians in Gaza and we'll have peace. So sure. we did it. We tried it. And what's happened is a series of wars and constant rocketing and uh, a, a crazy um, black market and just a lot of violence and terror and certainly the very opposite of more peace for Israel and frankly the very opposite of more peace for people who call themselves Palestinians. It just really hasn't worked out for anybody. Um, but okay, so what happens when uh, a country recognizes the state of Israel? Well, it's pressure, it's pressure, it's not nice. Um, Israel for a long time has really felt itself to be a country that needs um, international backing. I think that that's something that is both true, right? We do live in an international community. And so to some degree, we do need to operate in an international community. On the flip side, I think it's something that we really have to mature out of. You know, Israel is a young country. Baruch Hashem, I think we have really um, come a long way. Hashem has been with us and the Jewish people are really awesome. So we have uh, managed to succeed in a lot of ways. Um, and one of the things that we have to do now, in case you can't see, I'm a religious person, right? So my views are definitely informed by that. Um, and I would say that like bringing that in, like we have to get out a little bit of what's called like a galut mentality, like this mm -hmm. mentality that we are like people of the exile and we are weakened and we are victims um, and we're small. Um, because now in our region, we can see that we're actually small, but like small size wise, we don't take up a lot of space, but we're actually huge. Um, the Trump in, uh, administration really helped us kind of understand that. And so we have a lot of, um, a, a tremendous amount of appreciation because I think we learned, uh, aside from the actual accomplishments of getting the United States to move its embassy and the recognition of the Golan Heights and, and um, the uh, Pompeo Doctrine where uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo basically said that um, the United States no longer sees Jews in Judea and Samaria as occupiers, that is significant. But even more than that, I think that we learned that we live in a region that's kind of, given the right atmosphere, is like ready to accept us, seemingly. Now, I say that cautiously um, because I think that it remains to be seen how the Abraham Accords will pan out. But as it is, we have Morocco, the United Arab Emirates, Sudan, um, the All Saudis right. are like, you know, in the background there. Tell me, um, Malka, has, has, the, at, at government level, there's been those four uh, terrific agreements. Uh, we've right. been very, very supportive of them. Has it made any difference to uh, people like you who live in Judea, Samaria, who might be coming across uh, Arab communities from, from time to time? I mean, what hits the news here is when things go wrong, when there's a, a drive-by shooting or, right. or something. Um, in, in the last 12 months, has, have you noticed any change in, in atmosphere? Well, I, I like live a little bit on social media. Ishai and I are particularly involved in Twitter, also on Facebook, but especially on Twitter. And there is on the like public level, on the people level, there's a massive change. A right. massive change. I can't say exactly what's going on with governments. That's like above my pay grade. But in the, in the regular public discourse, there's like a love-a-thon happening, happening, especially between um, 
uh, Israelis and people from the United Arab Emirates, but also, yeah. but also Saudis, like people are cropping up from all over the place with like Israeli flags in their profiles and stuff like that. Like, like, and you're sort of like, whoa, you know what I mean? Like, first of all, didn't expect that, right? Did not expect that. Correct. Correct. Um, and yeah. secondly, where does it come from? This like super energy, this desire to become close to Jews, to learn Hebrew. There are really people out there. And I think that sometimes we forget that uh, we as, as Jews and we as Israelis are like very interesting to people. And we really symbolize a kind of freedom and a kind of miraculous growth that the whole region has not experienced for itself and that okay. it really wants to experience. One last question before I hand to uh, Alan. Um, what about uh, the Arab communities that are closer to you, those that are uh, either living uh, within the state of Israel proper or in Judea, Samaria? Has, has there been any shift in attitudes there? We, we, we detect from here the uh, entrenched old negativity in, in those communities. What's, what's your view? So my view and i'm just one person like you introduced me at the beginning i'm just one mom of three people living in judea you know sure, sure. um but my my impression is that and my impression is that when we are strong and successful the neighbors become a lot less there's a lot less animosity, a lot more, a lot less aggression. We saw actually a shift a little bit when the Biden administration came in, and not when they came in, even when they started to pass all these, all these things about Israel and things started to shift again in the State Department. We actually, I mean, in the news at least, right? I'm not like I don't have my ear on the uh, on the phone with uh, anyone from the IDF, so I don't know what really goes on. But like in the news, we've seen an uptick in violence. Yes. This uptick in violence seems to have happened as Israel has kind of like gone limp a little bit as it stopped like charging forward with progress, with pride, um, asserted itself, asserted its, um, its at least its, its uh, readiness to take sovereignty over places in Judea and Samaria, even though we didn't actually manage to achieve that. Um, under Trump and Netanyahu, and you could say that, that you could speculate that that's for a wide variety of reasons. Some of them could be more positive, some of them could be more negative. Um, but I think that that um, that that is bigadol. I think also, you know, Isha and I were we were recently um, invited to an iftar. It's Ramadan, um, and we feel that here, especially in Judea and Samaria and in Eastern Jerusalem, you really like sense it because there's they're they're generally at home in the daytime they come out in the nighttime because they're fasting in the day they come out and eat in the night and and they have more energy at that time we were invited to an iftar which is a like um, a nighttime meal mm -hmm. in Hebron at the house of a muhtar uh named uh jabari muhammad jabari oh, and and, yeah. right a businessman who yeah. um is kind of not so popular with the palestinian authority or with hamas Yep. Um, because he really, his whole deal is let's do upward mobility for everybody. Israel is a place that is way more tuned into the idea of upward mobility. Certainly the Palestinian Authority is not here. You can see yet again, they have decided that it's not a good time to hold elections because of Israel, right? Because of Israel. Israel's not letting... Um, People vote in Eastern Jerusalem. So we cannot have elections at all. No democracy for anyone because of Israel, okay? So there are certain people um, amongst that population who see right through that stuff, um, including Muhammad Jabari. And he had an iftar for lots and lots of like, especially Jews from Judea and Samaria. And included in that event were some, and I cannot overly talk about it because it's really a danger to the people involved. Um, but there were some officials from the Palestinian Authority, people who could not be right. named, do not want to be um, associated with it, who are like, listen, we're totally into this, especially economic cooperation mm -hmm. between Israel and um, people who call themselves Palestinians. Uh, but if but if they would see our faces in the pictures, we would be fired minimally. 
Um, there have been people who took part in events like this who've been arrested, tortured. It's real. Um, and I really uh, take my hat off to those brave people who really want to make inroads um, between Jews and um, Arabs here locally, right here. Um, and we're involved in that, you know, so I am a person who um, feels very strongly and speaks very openly about Jewish rights all over the land of Israel and our um, absolute right to sovereignty in these areas. And yet I'm a person who works on, if you want to call it, use the word peace. I'm a person who works on peace between um, Israelis and Arabs because we realize that we live in a region and Arab, this is an Arab region. This is a Jewish state but this is an Arab region and it's theirs, their region okay. rightfully and it's our state rightfully. Those are both true. Okay. Um, right. And so we work on good relations. Okay, Malka, um, from where we sit, it almost looks as if we're starting to see the, the beginning of the end of the Bibi Netanyahu era. era. Um, I was going to ask you when you were talking about the Abraham Accords, um, who's getting the credit for, for that? Is he getting the credit for it? Uh, and if we are seeing the beginning of the end of the, uh, the Bibi era, um, will it make much difference in terms of, of your lives um, once Bibi's no longer running the show? That is such a good question. Uh, I really wish I had a very much better answer for you. Um, is he getting the credit? Right now, I think that no one's... Jews are not so good at giving credit, A. B, I think that, and God bless us, right? We're okay. awesome. But I think that, that uh, like, we're not in a place right now where people are talking about that so much. I mean, I don't even think that Netanyahu himself has been overly running on a campaign of, I, I don't know, I don't, like, understand the BB campaign um, so much. I think that though one day he absolutely will be. I think right now Israel is very entrenched in its political battle. And I think that people as a whole, it's not like everyone wants to see Yair Lapid or everyone wants to see Naftali Bennett or everyone, anyone wants to see. I think Israelis are at this place now where they're just like ready to wipe the slate <laughs> and just do the whole, like bring in all new people. I think that five elections is a lot. No one wants this. Um, and I think it's been unpleasant to watch our politicians um, bicker and battle over these things when really what the people just want is a functional government that will move forward. They have voted for a right-wing government, um, but the way that the, vote, that the system works in Israel is that you need these coalitions. And then on top of everything, you now have, have parties which are basically not BB parties, like just not BB. And that's what they're running on. Um, you know, I think that Prime Minister Netanyahu will be on the money one day. And I mean physically, like on the paper. I think that he has been um, a Prime Minister who has by far not done everything right. I myself um, take major issue with some of his policies or lack of policies. But overall, I think that he has been a very good Prime Minister. I think that he is uh, a diplomatic genius. I think that he um, has been able to do things in the international community that probably no one else would have ever been able to do. Mm. Um, inside Israel, there's, a, you know, more issues. Um, it will be the day that Bibi goes home, which may be soon, will be a sad day um, for Israel. But I think that we're good at picking up and moving on. And that's also our responsibility to do. Um, do people give him credit? That's not the stage we're in. I don't think, I, I mean, the, the people who vote for him do. They call him Bibi Amelech, right? Bibi the king. Um, and there are people who are just like only Bibi, only Bibi, only Netanyahu. And they really admire him to a tremendous, tremendous degree. And then there are other people who are just ready to see something new. What, what about in terms of the Abraham Accords though? Is I mean, it was, he would have been largely responsible for that, do you, is that correct? I mean, I think so. I think he was largely responsible. I think that some people, um, though in Judea and Samaria, are kind of rubbed the wrong way that application of sovereignty in the Jordan Valley and in places in Judea and Samaria kind of didn't happen seemingly as a result of, or as a trade for the Abraham Accords. And there are those of us out mm -hmm. there who like don't want to 
have to make diplomatic relationships based on us doing something that is is not in our interest. Um, and that doesn't feel so good. But I think that time will tell. I think that, I mean, there's been a massive, let's put Corona aside for a second. There's been a massive wave of travel of Israelis to the United Arab, Arab Emirates, to Bahrain. People are just like flying there in droves. Everyone's so interested to go and to see. And everyone I know who's come back from there has said how welcoming people are and how accepting they are and how interested they are in meeting an Israeli. Um, and so I think that in that sense, the Abraham Accords is really real. Um, but yeah, I think that that Netanyahu, he, there's no one, there's no one who's going to be able to be like that smooth operator in the international community, like Prime Minister Netanyahu. He is gifted. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've seen him give speeches um, to Congress, and it's like ovation, 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 ovation. I mean, they the response to our Prime Minister is like unbelievable because his English is so good, and he's very charming, and he really understands what the values are, and is able to. Um, Put his finger right on the button of them and and he really i think he really represents uh and i hope he represents a transition from what came before him which was a much more left leaning israel into a much more right uh leaning israel is he going to help us charge forward into that full right-wing israel i'm not sure but i think that he has definitely helped us get there well i, I suppose history will be the judge so that will be yes. interesting to watch just one more from me, and then we'll go to questions. I've got uh, I've got Ron, Leon, on Dennis. If anybody else uh, wants to ask a question, now's the time to let me know. But Malka, um, you, you touched on the U.S. administration. Um, I'm just wondering, what do people in Judea and Samaria think about the Biden administration? I think I can guess. But w would you say that it might even be worse than the Obama administration was? Are you worried about that? That's interesting. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, I'm not sure what could be worse than the Obama administration. That was really, really bad. Um, and like the last act that Obama did in office was to pass like hundreds of millions of dollars to the Palestinian Authority, which, which really, to me is, if you speak to people on the Palestinian street, there's almost no one, if you speak to them, like if you start talking, you get them to really open up, there's almost no one who will say that the Palestinian Authority is good. And we're not even talking about the issue of a Palestinian state or national, uh, a national identity for Palestinians. We're talking about the organization, the Palestinian Authority. They are just the worst and they hold people down. The, the leaders of the Palestinian Authority are just so corrupt. And we know that Yasser Arafat's widow is a billionaire. I mean, it's, it's so gross. It's, it's the grossest thing ever. Um, so, you know, the Obama administration was like right up in there supporting the Palestinian Authority. The Biden administration, it has its hands full a little bit more than the Obama administration did, I think, with Corona and with trying to deal with kind of the international, the national fracturing that seems to be happening inside the United States and the cultural conflict that seems to, at least from the outside, I don't live in the United States obviously anymore, but it's kind of looking messier inside the United States than it did back under the Obama administration. But yeah, you know, Biden, he's already going to start sending money back to UNRWA which is an organization that uh, works actively on a daily basis to thwart the state of Israel and to undermine the state of Israel, even as it claims to be an organization that represents the rights of refugees, um, even though it's been over 70 years since the state of Israel is created, they kind of keep these people in a situation of being refugees and they, they have never really empowered them in any way. Um, and so there's like a lot of cynical actors that the Biden organization, Biden administration seems to be um, going back to. And in that sense, maybe you could say that the Biden administration is worse because they could have just not, right? They could have just left it. Whereas the Obama administration came in and all those um, relationships had already been formed. The, under Trump, the, those relationships were erased and the Biden administration is actively renewing them like they're actively renewing the um, Iran nuclear deal. So that if you wanted to, you could see that as kind of an even more 
horrible, <laughs> I don't know, cynical move. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Malika. Look, we'll take questions. Um, first, uh, we've got Ron Leon Dennis as the first three. Please just keep them to a single question so that everybody gets a turn. So, Ron, you're first. Please unmute yourself and fire away. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, Ron. Oh, hi, good evening. And thank you for your very passionate um, activism, what you're doing. It's, it's very inspiring. Thank you so much. I wanted to thank ask you. you, there are a lot of um, Jewish donors, philanthropists, who are funding um, universities, especially in the United States, that have very strong anti-Israel agendas where Jewish students suffer a lot, um, and also Jewish um, academics who are also falling in line with this. Have you ever tried to um, publicly debate them and do an Ariel Gold on them as well? <laughs> it would be worth, uh, and publicly right. let them know I mean, that they are funding anti-Semitism. Right, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. The truth is that um, Ishai has been our front man in our family <laughs> for a long time. I'm only uh, sort of recently come out as, um, as a voice publicly, I guess you could say. Um, you know, I'm, I guess I'm up to debate. I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly what to say about it, except to say that the United States academic community is in massive, massive trouble if you're talking about the kind of values that we hold dear. If you're talking about um, Jewish pride, if you're talking about uh, traditional Jewish values, if you're talking about um, believing that the state of Israel isn't evil, right? Like, let alone that it's something good, uh, which I certainly believe. I believe that the state of Israel is a miracle, that it's a gift, that it's a gift to the Jews, that it's a gift to the world, that it's um, a worthy partner in the international community. Would I be willing to debate? Yeah, set it up. I, you know, I, uh, I've never been asked, but, uh, okay. but certainly we need to, we need to take them on. It's sort of like their voices seem to be so much louder um, than ours in the United States, at least. And that's very, very troubling. Yeah, well, this might be the launch of your international career, Malka, so yes, who knows. Great. <laughs> um, Leon, Leon, you're next. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Oh, yes. Good evening, Malka. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes I do. Come yes. On. Now, uh, Malka, um, what, in your view, is the current state of what Israelis call chosen le'umi, overriding or overarching national strength, despite the various differences that exist, um, uh, for example, among uh, Haredim and uh, secular and left and right and so forth. Um, is there an overarching national strength that can withstand all the challenges that the future might hold for Israel? It's a really beautiful question. I actually love that question um, because what you want me to talk about is really Jewish unity and do we still have it? Um, and I would say the answer is yes. The, 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 the general answer is yes. The complicated answer is more complicated. Um, if you read the big book on the Jews, the Torah, then you will see that the Jews have been in much worse shape nationally than they are today with sword fights, with divisions between the tribes, with all kinds of really, really messy stuff. Happens to be that the Jewish people, at least in the land of Israel, have finally gotten together after 2000 years in all kinds of different places with all kinds of different values from all kinds of different backgrounds. And now here we are. And we're all trying to get together and we're all trying to like make a country that we can all feel good to live in. So that's gonna be spicy sometimes. That's not always gonna be so smooth. Um, but I would say I'm very proud of, of the Jewish people. You know, we do have one party um, that is Lieberman's party that is like an anti, it's sort of like we're fighting the Haredim. Um, which I find to be so off-putting. Now, I am not Haredi. I am what you would call Torani, I guess, Datilu Umi. Um, and I see that as a political distinction more than a religious distinction, because I'm also a person just like, I may wear different clothes, but I also try to keep the mitzvot and to do what I think that Hashem wants me to do. Um, and that way, I really see that we have uh, almost everything in common. Um, but, you know, there are Hi, Hashem is very smart, and um, 
because the Jews have a tendency to fall out of love with each other, sometimes a few things come together and remind us um, that we really are one. Um, the example, the most recent example, of course, is the horrible catastrophe which happened in Meiron, the deaths of 45 uh, beautiful, beautiful souls. And as we're learning about more and more about who those people are, we realize what a tremendous loss it is um, for our nation. And you really saw even in Tel Aviv, the lighting of candles, um, a sense of mourning, uh, national mourning. It was officially national mourning in Israel um, with the day of mourning um, officially declared and, and flags brought down to half mast. And we're talking about a secular state, right? Which brought down its flags for 45 people. And I have no idea how those people felt about the state. I don't know, maybe they loved it, maybe they hate it, I don't know. But, uh, but the state of Israel saw these people as, as dear precious Israelis who were lost in a horrible tragedy and, and we all mourned it together. I certainly have never, I have not heard one uh, untoward word about it um, that would make me feel like there's some, you know, a, a special hatred that would lead to anyone, God forbid, to be okay with this or, or happy about it. Um, I think that Jewish unity is a topic which crops up over and over again, and it's something we have to remind ourselves of always. I think that's something that you always have to do in a big family, is kind of remind yourselves uh, sometimes what, what connects you. Um, but there's so many people like that, and, and I, do, I really do believe that we have what it takes to weather the storms of what's coming. I even see it in the political situation that we've talked about a lot this evening, um, even as people are kind of like grossed out and tired, there's no, um, you know, there have been some demonstrations and protests, which I see as, as healthy, more or less healthy democratic kind of uh, voicing of opinions. Nothing radical. You haven't seen the kinds of acts that you saw, for example, in the United States with race wars and the breaking of windows and anarchists and things like that. You really haven't seen that here. I think that people just want to live their lives and do well. And I think that people are happy to do that together. But of course, we all have to make sure that we got our midot, that we got our um, good character traits activated when, when we're dealing with our people. And that's something that we have to work with uh, within ourselves, within our families, and to always remind each other and, and ourselves that we are here to love each other and to be part of the family. Yeah, thank you. Now, uh, Dennis, Max, I'll come to you. Just before we, we do, there's a question on the chat, uh, also from Dennis. I suspect that's a, a, another Dennis. Um, have you, uh, Malka, have you met any wealthy Palestinians who are in favour of the trump Kushner Peace to Prosperity Plan? What do they say? So I can't really say that I have my finger so on the pulse that I like hang with all the wealthy Palestinians. But the iftar that I mentioned to you before by Ma uh, Mahmoud Jabari, by Muhammad Jabari, it was, he's a very wealthy Palestinian and he's like at the forefront, he was at the forefront of uh, peace to prosperity. And that's how he kind of got in trouble with the Palestinian Authority. Um, because they were they were anti as a matter of principle and he was like why this is a great opportunity like let's make some money money will so actually solve a lot of problems if people feel like they're doing well and they can do business and if Jews are doing business with Arabs then they don't want to kill each other right they want to like have successful business let's just do that and the Palestinian authorities like no because we need a Palestinian state because occupation because human rights and all the kind of dogma that they always throw at everything. Um, but my in my very limited experience, it's those people who want the peace to prosperity the most. I mean, unless you know, I haven't met the very wealthy, um, higher upper echelons officials from the Palestinian Authority. I would imagine they don't want peace to prosperity, uh, but I really don't know. Okay, uh, Dennis, uh, please unmute yourself and ask your question. In part, my question was uh, similar to the one that's just uh, that you just picked off off the chat, but let me just ask it this way: You mentioned you went to an iftar. You obviously have some quite a bit of contact with the Muslims living in Judea and Samaria, and I want to know whether you believe there is any change in attitude, given that there are uh, Arabs working in Jewish businesses, there is inter they are working in, the, in what is called the settlements, in the, village, in the villages and towns uh, that Jews have established, 
Uh, obviously, a lot of them are trusted to work in those environments and they're earning income from it. Therefore, are you noticing any, ch and especially given that we're now in 16 years without an election for, uh, within uh, the West Bank for the uh, for uh, Abbas or against Abbas, we don't even know what their attitude is electorally. Have you noticed a change in attitude to the Jewish people amongst the general citizens, citizenry amongst the Muslims of Judea and Samaria? Wow, that's a that's a very good question. Um, again, I I I don't I don't think I have enough expansive experience to be able to answer that definitively. Only anecdotally can I really um, answer that. Um, and you know, we're like I said, Ishai and I are involved fairly actively in dialogue organiz uh, one particular dialogue organization called Habait, the Home, um, which is about really creating um, a meeting place for uh, Jews who, and these are Jews with strong views about um, our rights in Judea and Samaria and local Arabs. A lot of those local Arabs, um, those people, again, anecdotal, right? Just based on my experience, a lot of those people, what they really would like is for Israel to take total control, get them out from under the thumb of the Palestinian Authority, give them rights, give them upward mobility, um, and, and they would be content with that. You know, if Ishai were here, he would tell you, my husband, he would tell you stories about um, Arabs who were like, just give me the blue identity card and I will send my kid to the army. Like, I'm ready. Um, you know, that's not everybody, of course. There's still a, a strong nationalistic um, effort on the part of people within the Palestinian Authority um, to continue the battle for the land. Um, there is a such a massive land grab that's happening in in some parts of Judea and Samaria that if I would told if I would talk to you about it, then all your faces would fall and this would end as a as a sad uh, talk instead of a happy talk. Um, but there the battle is still on 100%. The battle is still on. But on the micro level, when you're dealing with people, individuals are individuals. I don't know to what degree people who are in favor of a stronger Israel are able to organize or to talk about it with each other. I would estimate probably not so much. Um, it's just dangerous. They, they, it's, you know, in Israel, you're allowed to vote for the anti Haredi party, or you're allowed to vote for the merits party, or you're allowed to vote for, uh, you know, Itamar Ben Gvir. You're allowed to vote for all those people. Um, and if you do that, your neighbor might be like, ew, but they're not going to, you know, hurt you. Well, and it's not like that in the Palestinian Authority, unfortunately. Mm. Okay, thanks. Uh, we've got Ruben, Debbie and Saul. Um, just a reminder to keep the question short, please, because we're, we're, we're coming up uh, to time. Ruben, um, please unmute yourself and ask your question. My question is regard to the picture behind you, the... There was, uh, I, I don't know if it's happened or it's in the process of happening that the old marketplace was going to be demolished and new road to Marat Mikpela made and access, disability access to it. Um, can you tell, tell us what's happening there? Is it, has it started? Has it happened? Or is it in the process of happening? Um, I don't know all the intricate uh, engineering details. I do know that um, it's been approved and then it's been almost approved and then it's been held up. Hebron is one of those places that um, nothing goes fast. <laughs> everything, goes, everything goes slow. It's, it's, some, it's a place unlike any other place in Israel, I think, where really the army is super involved, the, the Ministry of Defense is involved and things that happen, like little things like the fixing of roads and, and things like that. Um, the last I heard, the elevator is going up. There hasn't been a um, like crew come in yet to, to do it, but it's happening, yeah. Okay, thank you. Debbie, please unmute yourself. Okay, uh, oh, hi, Malka. Um, hi. Hi, I was wondering, do you have any, um, any um, ideas for a solution for you know peace in the Judea, uh, Judea and Samaria? Wow! So just like, how do I solve it? Good question. 
Um, look, that is such a massive question. We could really have a whole night dedicated to that. But on one foot, I'll tell you that um, the idea of nationalism for, for the local Arab population is, is quite new. Um, Jewish nationalism, the idea of Jewish nationalism on this soil is really, you know, thousands of years old, whereas the idea of Palestinian nationalism on this soil is about 50, 60 years old, 70 years old. It's very, very, um, it's very, very new. Now we have a state. What's, what seems to be the problem? What does everyone want to make the problem out to be? The problem is that we have this land and the Jews want it and the Arabs want it, right? The Jews want it and the Palestinians want it. And that's, it's not fair because the Jews, uh, you know, have it and maybe the Palestinians should have it. And what about their national rights? Now, there is a state very nearby, which is actually full of people who claim to be Palestinians, uh, particularly a lot of people um, who either came out of the land of Israel during the war or related to the people um, who live right in this region, and that is Jordan. Now, Jordan has never been made to bear any pressure for the situation that's going on, but we know that the, la the latest king of Jordan married a Palestinian girl, uh, partially because she is very pretty and lovely, and partially because she's Palestinian and because such a huge percentage, I can't remember what it is, I think 60, 70 percent, uh, maybe even 80 percent of the population is Palestinian in Jordan, um, they, he had to like bring in a queen to appease that population. In 1988, I think it was, or 87, um, a massive percent of Arabs living in Judea and Samaria today had Jordanian citizenship. And King Abdullah, King Hussein, excuse me, King Hussein, um, withdrew, unilaterally withdrew the citizenship of all those thousands and thousands and thousands of people, which is illegal. It's an illegal act um, and basically made them stateless and basically gave birth to a baby and left it on our doorstep. He basically said, these people are now your people, you deal with them, right? So that has created a situation in which you have people who feel stateless. They don't have a state. Mm -hmm. They don't have a place to refer back to. They're not Israeli. They're not Jordanian. Um, and it has created a hot atmosphere whereby Israel feels the pressure to solve this problem. And I would say this is actually Jordan's problem to solve. Restore the citizenship of these people. Now, the question is, should do we have to forcibly necessarily move them to Jordan? No. Um, there are many people who call themselves expatriates of various countries who live in different places. They feel that they want to live in this place over here, but they keep the, the citizenship of this place, this place over there. If the people truly want, um, so they have national aspirations and they want to actualize themselves nationally, yet they do not want to leave the lands that they live on in Israel, I say restore them their citizenship, which was theirs and which was un unlawfully and, and cruelly taken from them, restore them their citizenship, allow them, therefore, free access into Jordan or out of Jordan. Therefore, they can make the decision, where do you want to live? Maybe they would like to live in Jordan, and they haven't been afforded that opportunity. Or maybe they would like to stay in Israel and vote in Jordan. They can live here, have businesses, just like many people who are residents of other countries. Let them stay. They want to stay, let them stay. But then they'll be citizens of Jordan and able to really actualize themselves nationally if they were really afforded democracy in Jordan, which they're not today, but if they were really afforded democracy, in five seconds, they would take that country and make it into a Palestine. They would just vote themselves into government, make it into a Palestine. And this issue, in my opinion, would by and large, by and large now, go away. That's how I see it. That's the Malka plan. Anyway. <laughs> Sounds like a good plan. Um, last question from Saul. So please unmute yourself, Saul, and ask your question. Yeah, that's a fantastic answer to the most complex question. Absolutely incredible. Could I just ask a question that one feels embarrassed to ask and feels one shouldn't have to ask it at all? Is it really important that the Prime Minister of Israel should be absolutely at home in English with English expressions. 
That is, is a it great really question. an important question? Should it be a question at all? I don't think that that's an embarrassing question. I think that that's a, an important question. Um, and, and let me think about that for a second. I think that, uh, I think that Israel is meant to be a nation. I'm going to speak a little poetically now, just out of my sheer feelings, right? But I think that Israel is a nation which is meant to be a light to the world. Um, I think it's meant to be an emblem of, of, I'm, again, I'm a religious person, okay? So I think it's meant to really symbolize um, the intersection between heaven and earth, <clears throat> that it's really meant to be a place which um, brings ideas, brings a spirit out to the world, um, which, which is at the forefront of, of ideology, which is at the forefront of technology, which is at the forefront of medicine. I believe we're meant to be at the forefront of pushing out knowledge out into the world, knowledge and wisdom. Uh, does that mean that the whole world therefore should learn Hebrew? I mean, I welcome you, right? But I think that if uh, English is kind of uh, the lingua franca today, then it makes sense that our leader and that leaders amongst the people of Israel would be able to interact with the peoples of the world. Do I think that it's because we need to be sure that other people understand us because they shouldn't have to come toward us and we have to come toward them? No, I, I, don't, I don't see it from a, that kind of place. Um, but I do recognize that English is the language of the world, uh, the language that the diplomatic community and the kind of world culture is taking place in today. And so, you know, I welcome that. I mean, I think that it wouldn't be the worst thing if the prime minister of Israel learned a little Chinese either, as we can see that mm. is a country which is really stepping up. Um, uh, you know, but I think what you're really touching on also is not just do, does the prime minister have to learn English um, so that we can interact, but uh, do we have to keep being people who mold ourselves into something that other people can deal with or should they be molding themselves a little bit more toward us so i say option b i definitely <laughs> think that that the world should and i and i i think that we're going to get there i really do i i'm a person who believes in like the long game in the marathon i believe in god I believe that he has been with us. I believe that he's going to be with us. Uh, I believe that, you know, there's a saying in Judaism, the, the salvation of God is like the blink of an eye, which you could also take a different way, which means things can change at any second. Today, it's like this. Tomorrow, it's like that. You never know. Um, we have been through so much in our uh, illustrious, illustrious history. And uh, I think that God, as an author, um, wrote this, like, incredible story of the Jews that pretty much all of you, I guess, have in your homes, the Tanakh. And I think that uh, the story continues and I think the story is still being written. And so as a person who likes to read, I know mm. that the endings mm. of stories are typically, they typically wrap things up in an incredible way. And so I think that's what we have to look forward to. Well, on that note, Malka, that was, it was very inspiring to listen to you speak that way. Um, and I want to thank you for joining us on our session. It's just been so refreshing. Uh, I, urge you, I urge you to stay vocal. Um, we, we got to know Yishai when he was in Australia, and I, and I was very impressed. I, I'm, I, I thought I found that he was a very capable and talented person. But I'm, now I'm starting to wonder if he might not, not actually win every argument at home. <laughs> I work hard to ensure that doesn't happen. <laughs> so, Malka, I want to thank you again. Um, wonderful to have you. And, thank you um, so much for the opportunity. Uh, thanks you. And I'll just hand back to David for some closing remarks. Okay, look, thank you, Alan. And uh, thank you so much, Malka. That was, that was very nice. You, you sort of skirted around one issue, but I, I need to let Bring you know. Bring it back, Yala. I don't want to well skirt. Informed. We have had regular... We, we've had... We've had a, a, a representative of Regavim talk about the uh, the stealing of land in uh, Area C and, uh, and and so this group does know. Um, now the, the last thing I've got to do is, as as per usual, uh, see what's happening about uh, next week. Got that open? Oh, it's not sharing. 
you, you have now, David. But there we go. No, it's the wrong. It's it's the wrong share item. Uh, Okay, ah, here it is. Sorry about that. Technical itch. Next week, we're, uh, we've tried to avoid coronavirus all, all year, but uh, next week we're getting uh, stuck into it with uh, Gideon Rosner. Uh, Gideon is the Director of Policy of the Institute of Public Affairs. Now he has said publicly, although uh, it might not be so well known, that uh, Gideon in, in that advocacy office uh, doesn't hide the fact that he's Jewish, and I can let you know because he's let people know publicly that he's also a member of HAA. So uh, we'll be talking about some of the government reactions with regard to lockdowns, state border closures, wearing masks outdoors, travel restrictions, etc. He's got some particularly strong views. And finally, as we always do, um, if you are not yet on our email list, it's important to uh, do self-subscribe at the website, jewishassociation.org.au. Like and follow the Facebook page in particular for our news and views. And we do need tangible support. So if you are not yet a member, please join and uh, consider making a donation via the donate button on the website as well. So... Thank you again, Malka, for a for a wonderful session. Thank and you. Alan, back to you for closing. Mal thanks, uh, thanks, David. Malka, uh, please give our best wishes to Yishai. We we look forward to the time when either you guys visit us or we can visit you. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining Thank us. Thank you very, very much. God bless you. Thank you. Okay, that's it, everybody. Until uh, until next week when uh, we're back again at eight pm on Wednesday. We look forward to seeing you all then, uh, but for now, it's good night to you all. Bye for now.